Hey everyone, I wanted to do just a real quick preface to this video. I'm sure some of you who saw the title and the thumbnail, you're probably wondering why I decided to sit down with Russ. And I want to explain a little bit about why I think it's important. So first of all, I think in general, I want to approach life believing that I don't know everything. And it's easy for me to gravitate to people who have like mind and similar objectives uh, in life, but I think that's only one part of how you become a more well-rounded person. I think another key to that is to listen to people who don't share the same perspective you do, who come from a different background. And every once in a while, you'll learn something that you didn't know before and have a greater appreciation for other people's perspectives. And these are some reasons why I decided to sit down with Russ. I also found myself really intrigued by Russ's background, have a greater appreciation for what he does as a journalist. Though I don't agree with everything that he says, I, uh, I appreciated the opportunity to sit down with him. And I would ask the same of you, to give him your attention, and you don't have to agree with everything that he says, but my guess is if you give him the chance, you'll find some things that you appreciate about his perspective. So let's go ahead and jump in. Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Sean Mitchell, All Things EV, and on this video, I'm sitting down with Russ Mitchell, staff writer for the LA Times, and we're gonna talk auto, we'll talk Tesla, technology, and maybe some other things. So Russ, thanks so much for taking the time to jump on. It's my pleasure. Looking forward to getting to know you a little bit more. Uh, we've had some brief correspondences uh, with uh, on, on Twitter and, and via email. You follow Tesla quite a bit and you write about them for the LA Times. Um, when we were talking previously, that auto is not how you got started, right? Uh, no, I uh, started uh, as a general assignment reporter um, for the Southern Illinoisan in Southern Illinois, covering uh, prisons and coal. Uh, over the years, uh, I've worked at different publications and uh, in the early 80s, I uh, saw that technology and business uh, were coming together. And uh, this was when PCs started becoming very uh, popular, PCs and, and Macs, very popular. Um, and I just saw kind of a revolution happening and started covering uh, technology, um, computer companies, uh, et cetera. And, uh, but uh, in 1985, I was hired by Business Week and uh, stationed in Detroit. So I got uh, some auto industry coverage under my belt. This is the time of Roger Smith at General Motors and Lee Iacocca at Chrysler and Don Peterson at Ford. Um, the auto industry was in deep trouble at the time. Just imagine the uh, Cadillac Cimarron, or if you don't know about that car, look it up online and you can see what I'm talking about. But they were trying to emerge. Ford came out with the Taurus. Um, Ross Perot was trying to take uh, General Motors uh, over uh, from uh, Roger Smith. It was a very interesting time to be there. Subsequently, I've covered everything from uh, the Defense Department at the Pentagon, uh, including the, the first Gulf War, uh, artificial intelligence, supercomputing. And um, in my current job, as automobiles and technology are becoming ever more intertwined, I think I'm in a pretty good position to, uh, at least from a journalist perspective, to, uh, to, to cover that revolution in the auto industry. It seems like things are progressing quite quickly in terms of innovation. The, the pace of innovation in, in automotive seems to just sort of hit high gear over the last, I don't know, five, five years. Maybe it's my, my perception of things. What, what would you, what, how do you look at the auto industry at the moment and where they're headed? Well, like almost everybody, it's in deep trouble right now. Uh, we'll see what happens, um, how, how quickly the economy will uh, revive, whether there's a second wave of coronavirus. Um, so uh, let's put that aside and uh, assume that uh, the, the cash flow problems and the demand problems are temporary and not persistent. Um, the auto industry has increased, throughout their history, they've been uh, adding new technology to automobiles in the last, you're right, about five years or so. Uh, they've been rapidly adding uh, new uh, ADAS features, 
I don't even remember what that stands for. Do you remember? Assisted driving something, maybe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, basically, it's uh, driver assist technologies like uh, lane keeping, um, uh, um, automated cruise control, etc. cetera. Uh, they've been adding more and more pieces of that. They're becoming more and more sophisticated. And uh, they're, they, they started out in higher end models and they're trickling down to, to uh, uh, cheaper models now. Um, that's probably the biggest change in, in automobiles in the last few years. Of course, electric cars are uh, beginning to become more popular. Uh, the jury's still out as to how, especially in the United States, uh, how quickly and how enthusiastically people will gravitate that way. But that's also uh, um, a, bi a, a big change to, to keep an eye on. And, uh, and then uh, totally driverless cars also. Um, they're uh, they're not they're not appearing as quickly as the people uh, at at the startups jockeying for venture capital a few years ago were uh, were predicting. But uh, they're making rapid strides, and and we'll see more and more of that uh, on the roads in the future. Right. Um, I, I looked it up. So ADAS is Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Okay. I'll try to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a mouthful. I understand why they created an acronym for it. Were you covering auto when the EV1 came out in the late, I think it was the late 90s? I was not. When, when you look at electric vehicles, do you, do you, are, are they a viable option? I, I heard a little bit of, of doubt there when you were talking about electric versus uh, combustion. So um, wh where are they missing the mark at the moment? I mean, if, if, if you were, as I understand it, you're not an electric vehicle driver right now, you don't own one, but wh where is it missing the mark and where does it need to be competitive to convince people to transition from combustion to electric? Well, let me state from the start that I'm a fan of EVs. In terms of driving, I like to drive uh, uh, ICE cars. I like to drive EVs. They're different. I snowboard. I used to ski. Uh, they're both great in their own ways. They're, they're, uh, they both go from uh, point A to point B, but in different ways. The same thing with EVs and, and ICE cars. Um, as much as I like driving ICE cars, I do uh, acknowledge that they're very bad for uh, uh, in terms of pollution and global warming, and uh, we need to tr uh, transition to cleaner transportation. So I, I am not a uh, by any means an opponent of uh, EVs. In fact, um, I, I, I hope they gain traction. The problem is that so far, aside from Tesla, and even Tesla's demand seems to be in the United States. Uh, beginning to level off. Uh, I, I, I don't see a rapid uptake on the part of consumers. Um, the two big reasons uh, well known are, are price, it costs a lot. Uh, it's still uh, very difficult to make money uh, selling an electric car if you're an automaker because of the cost of the battery. And uh, the, the range issues uh, also uh, are troubling to people who believe that they won't be able to load up their fuel tank, as it were, to get from, uh, say, uh, Los Angeles to Chicago. Yeah, I um, I think that the, the range piece is one of those things that I go back and forth on. I recently got my uh, Model S back from the body shop. During that time, the insurance company provided a, a a rental, car rental. It was a BMW 3 Series, 328i, I think. Really great car, really nice. And when I went to the gas station to fill it up, I think I got like, you know, 550 to 600 miles on a single tank of gas. And it's quite nice. I'm not going to lie. I found myself romanticizing about how little I needed to fill up. I mean, it, it was a hassle to have to go to a gas station versus just plug in the vehicle at home uh, with an electric. But um, it was it was quite attractive. And you know, will will the electric vehicle technology get there? Um, it seems like the energy density is heading in a positive direction. The the cost per kilowatt hour is decreasing. So I am optimistic about, about that, um, about things improving in that direction. Will it be exactly on par, you know, where, where you get 500 to 600 miles on a single 
tank of gas, probably not in, in the near term, but maybe there are some maybe there are some trade-offs. Maybe there are some maybe people will find it convenient to charge their electric vehicle at home and then just wake up and go to wherever they need to go. I guess the, the, the other thing too is um, uh, most people don't drive a full you know 500 miles in a single day unless you're on a road trip. So uh, for most people's uses, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that 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 addresses current EV range addresses most people's needs. The 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 electric vehicle market is still very much in its infancy. You have Tesla as a front runner in terms of number of number of vehicles sold. Um, uh, in, I think you said in previous conversations that you 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 admire what Tesla has done. Am I am I right? Am I, am I remembering correctly? Uh, in many ways, yes. The the when, when they first started producing the the Roadster, do you recall that early time period of Tesla and? Were you in the camp where you thought that they were a new startup that wasn't likely wasn't going to make it, or when you saw the product, did you did you have a lot of high hope for them? I wasn't really paying enough attention to have uh, high or low hopes, but I you know it was in the news. I was following it. Uh, I like cars, and uh, so I was paying attention. It, it seemed like a very interesting car. Um, in terms of making it or not making it at the time, uh, the auto industry was going through uh, a lot of problems in the, in the last uh, recession. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, cash flow and, and new capital during that period, it seemed very chancy and uh, they, did, they did squeak through. So um, I, I can't say I had a, uh, a, uh, enough, enough background intelligence to have a real strong opinion, but uh, I did see them as being vulnerable in the uh, financial crisis. When you, when you look at the electric vehicle uh, movement, it seems like there are various camps within that, that movement. Um, many people just love the performance of the electric vehicle, the instant acceleration, the power behind the, the electric motor. And other people are, are environmentally driven. They think that electric vehicles are contributing towards reducing emissions. Um, and, and then you have you have opponents of electric vehicles who say that 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 charging an electric vehicle from from the grid is 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 not not any any better. I'm surprised to go back to one of your other comments that that you are aware of of the environmental impact of of combustion engines. So Absolutely. Is is are electric vehicles a part of that solution to reducing the emissions? Do you see it as a viable option? Oh, there's no question. Uh, whether it's battery or electric, or in the future uh, fuel cells, um, or some technology that hasn't yet emerged, uh, or at least uh, among the general public, uh, reducing emissions is a is a uh, uh, crucial uh, a crucial issue for the human race to uh, to solve. I mean, it's uh, I believe in science. Uh, I believe um, in the idea that the earth is warming. All you have to do is look at the statistics. Um, you can argue how much humans are causing that and whether sunspots are causing that. Uh, but uh, the, the, the evidence, if, when you look at the curves and you look at the increase in human made um, uh, carbon dioxide and compare that with the increasing temperatures of the planet, uh, it, 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 it at least presents a very, very strong hypothesis that this is connected to human human beings. Um, the, the, the science, as far as I'm, I'm not a scientific expert, but uh, I've been covering science for a long time. And uh, I, I, I believe that this is a big issue. And it, it, I'm appalled uh, to learn that anybody with any um, education and intelligence and scientific understanding uh, doesn't get that. But I do understand that there are some people blow up the uh, the interest of the uh, oil industries is fighting uh, uh, electric uh, cars. I think they did in the past. I think they've seen the writing on the wall. So they're starting to hedge their bets. Shell is uh, getting involved in uh, 
hydrogen fuel cells, et cetera. Uh, I'm not saying they're good guys or bad guys, but they're, they're, they're beginning to address the issue. I don't see a cabal against electric cars, but I do see people um, justifiably looking at some of the, the um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Uh, the, the, the challenges that EVs have in the market. Uh, just real quick, uh, when we're talking about the trade-offs, um, one trade-off is when you use your car and what car you use. So at least at this point, even if range is, a, is an issue, many Americans, I'm getting off on this, uh, on a digression, I hope you don't mind, but uh, many Americans uh, have two or more cars. And if you work 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 miles from where you live, an electric car would make an awesome computer uh, commuter car. I mean, if you've got if you've got a if you can recharge it overnight, use it for local trips, use it for work, and use your other car for longer trips. That's one solution. You don't have to go total EV. So, um, uh, yeah, I think I think that uh, EVs or similar uh, transportation, clean class transportation technologies are, are crucial to our future. One of the things that, that I appreciate about about your approach to covering Tesla is, um, at least in, in your articles, you you try to you try to cover both opinions, both both sides, those those who have a favorable opinion of Tesla and those who are, are, are a little bit more critical. Um, I appreciate I appreciate both perspectives because I you know this is probably one of the reasons why I wanted to. Have a have a discussion with you. It's just just to get different perspectives, and you know, um, I think I think listening and trying to understand what those perspectives are are, are really important. Um, s some people who might be watching this video um, might might be really critical of of you. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the things that that, that I've seen. Um, you know, uh, tr tr trying to trying to stir the. The, the hornet's nest in, in some cases. Uh, the, the last thing I, I think I recall seeing was the, um, uh, were, were the Tesla workers uh, working during the, the, the pandemic and when, when things were, were shut down. Some people might see that as you intentionally trying to seek out the, 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 the negativity in, in things. But when I look through uh, my lens and what you're trying to do, I think you're just trying to, to, to sort out sort out a story that's relevant to relevant to your audience, your readers, and 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 try and get to the bottom of it, regardless of whether it's positive or negative. How would you respond to those people who 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 do hold that opinion that Russ is just a, a negative Tesla story seeker? On the uh, coronavirus shutdown, um, those stories were really focused on. The fact that Alameda County told uh, Tesla to shut down and Tesla said, uh, we're not going to. And Elon Musk said, uh, come arrest me. And uh, Alameda County uh, caved. Uh, I live in Alameda County. I'm uh, in the age category where I need to be concerned about the coronavirus. There are, um, it's, it's you know, the length of uh, lockdowns, the, uh, the rules around lo uh, lockdowns or stay at home orders. Uh, are controversial and nobody has the exact answers. But my point of view is if you have a rule, if you have a law, then uh, it should be consistent. And uh, and uh, just because a company employs a lot of people and has a lot of money, uh, you shouldn't uh, bow to their defiance to your local laws. That's, that's I have an opinion on that. That's my opinion. Um, in terms of... Uh, Negative stories, let me say that uh, I started covering Tesla in 2016. Um, I have pitched numerous stories that would probably come out perceived as uh, positive, including uh, profiles of um, manufacturing executives, uh, a story about how um, the cars are designed, which I've said in the past, I think the Model S is a really, at least on the exterior, is a very beautiful car. Um, and Tesla just doesn't want to do that. The uh, um, They don't want anybody, well, I should say they, Elon Musk seems to not want 
the attention on anybody but himself. So uh, I would propose a profile for, for instance, I, uh, this is back a few years ago, uh, they brought in a, a man from uh, Denmark to, uh, who worked at Lego to uh, help build and uh, equip the, the Gigafactory and run manufacturing. Uh, the idea of going from, uh, everybody knows Legos, so it would be appealing to general newspaper readers. Going from Legos to, you know, the exact exacting kind of manufacturing uh, techniques you would need to use for uh, in a battery factory it just seemed like kind of an interesting little story. Uh, that pitch went nowhere. Uh, Tesla has gone through many public relations heads, and each time they would choose a new one, I'd uh, go down to Fremont. I'd ask if they wanted to have some coffee. I'd go down and talk to one or two of them. And uh, by and large, mostly very pleasant people. Uh, they seemed to want to have those kinds of stories done too, uh, but they never happened. So if, if there's a company that wants to control the story and doesn't allow a reporter to come in to do positive stories or stories that might be considered neutral or positive, um, you still have to write about the company. And if uh, all that's left is uh, are the, the, the negative naysayers who have some legitimate, uh, particularly on the financial side, have some uh, legitimate concerns, uh, you might perceive the coverage as being uh, somewhat negative. I try to be as fair as possible. I'd love to tell Tesla's side of the story anytime they want to. They seem to not even have a public relations department anymore. Um, in the early days, Elon Musk would talk to me on the phone, meet with people from the LA Times. There was a, uh, they even made a, in this case, made another executive available when Mobileye broke off their relationship with uh, Tesla, made an executive uh, available to tell Tesla's side of the story. Uh, but when I ran the story, I also had mobile, mobilized side of the story, and that just drove them crazy. And from that moment on, Elon Musk has never talked to me. So what can I do? You're not the first journalist I've talked to who said that it's difficult to get access to, to people at, at Tesla to get a response. And... Um, you know, I, I think I can, I can, I think I know why they're they're doing that. Um, I don't, I don't think I'll say publicly on on the record for this for this conversation, but I think I understand why. To me, it appears like not giving a response at all to you or others ends up working more to their disadvantage, because then there's not a public comment from Tesla and you know uh, th th there's room for other people to fill in the gap in terms of what what that means and <laughs> what Tesla's intentions are and, and I don't yeah I, I don't quite understand why why that department has sort of gone into the abyss I don't I, I don't I, I can't I know of people that that would probably handle responses to things but I don't. I haven't heard of any anyone receiving comment from from Tesla PR, Tesla marketing, in quite a while. Absolutely, and uh, most of the people have left. And uh, one of the people who I used to deal with, it's not clear whether he's left or not. I'm told that he's not there anymore. Yet uh, his email still works, and uh, his his uh, uh, Tesla affiliation continues to be listed on uh, on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not begging for them to call me back. I'm just open to hearing their side of the story. Yeah, and and all the while, it appears like they do they do speak with journalists um, who tend to be far more favorable and run stories about their vehicles um, that that usually are, are pretty favorable, and um, they're. They've got a pretty good relationship with with what people would consider influencers, tech influencers, um, people who who are owners of the vehicles. 
how does that come across to you as someone who's a journalist uh, when, when Tesla's um, you know, sort of uh, aligning themselves with, with just favorable, favorable supporters of, of the company? Um, by and large, you don't see anybody from Tesla talking with uh, a journalist. Once in a while, Elon Musk uh, will do so when it's in his interest. Uh, but a lot of um, one site that we're all familiar with is Electric, which actually, you know, g- carries some very interesting news. But a lot of it is based on leaks from Tesla. They don't quote who they got it from. Uh, it's clearly somebody inside the company. You can, you know, maybe guess who. And um, it's up to the readers, I guess, to try to decide whether that's a PR channel or a journalism channel. That's that's not a decision for me to make. But uh, but the fact is that they leak a lot of uh, Tesla information. Um, Fred, who runs it, sometimes does a pretty good job of trying to fact check it. Um, sometimes he doesn't. Um, so uh, I guess that's my reaction. Where where does Tesla go from here if? If the company has aspirations of being an established automaker, where are some of your biggest concerns? And and I'd also sort of to to to, to in this question, I'd also love to hear your perspective on what what are they doing right? Where where first where are the opportunities for them to sort of sh- show the critics that they are they're here to stay? They've got a product that, that that's going to continue to to mature and and appeal to the public and then what are they what are they doing right where are they striking the right chord well i've said before i think that they're fun cars to drive uh at least two of the three look good to me um so i'll give them that they've uh they've 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 established uh, a a presence in the automobile market they've gotten a lot of people's attention uh, they've uh, shown that there's enough demand for electric cars for regulators to uh, either uh, stick with or double down on uh, uh, incentives, subsidies, edicts, and uh, requirements. So they've been very influential uh, in that way. Um, what they need to show, number one, will st- the whole coronavirus thing really uh, throws a wrench in you know, everybody's machinery. Um, Including Teslas, and it's uh, their 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 sales are going to be way down. Uh, there were signs that they were there are signs that they're having trouble selling cars in Europe. Uh, s- s- much uh, slower growth in the United States, particularly in California. Uh, China is a different, uh, totally different story. Um, but uh, what they really need to show after 17 years of existence is that they can make uh, consistent profits year after year uh, that are based on the sales of cars and not the sales of uh, ZEV credits uh, or any number of uh, accounting machinations that uh, are probably too too complicated to go into here. Not that people wouldn't understand it, we just, it's very, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, if you start kind of talking about accounts receivable, you start going down a, uh, a uh, rabbit hole of uh, fact and speculation that I think, you know, uh, might be left for another day. But uh, getting back to the issue at hand, they need to show that they can make money on the cars or they, they, they come, you know, they can make gross margins on the cars, they, they, but they've, they've got uh, supercharger networks, they've got R&D expenses, they're, ex, they're ex, say they're expanding in different markets. Uh, the company needs to make consistent profits with consistent free cash flow. So if, if, if they stop funneling money into capital expenditures, does that, does that automatically change the company for you? If, if they pull back on some of this breakneck growth and, and controlling some of these other areas that they, that they are, um, does that then does does that then change your opinion of of the company and and how profitable they can be? Um, well, that gets into corporate strategy, and there are some. Uh, it's not my place to 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 uh, set out Tesla's corporate strategy, but there are some who believe that if uh, the company had um, moved m- more slowly, 
uh, and, and I shouldn't say more slowly, less less ambitiously in terms of um, trying to sell millions of cars around the world. Uh, they could be profitable now selling, you know, new versions of the Model S and other high-end electric cars. But that's not the road they, they, they chose. Um, the idea was to make themselves a, a major presence uh, around the world to uh, really be a, a revolutionary agent for clean air, etc. Um, so that's pretty grand ambition. On the capital spending side, their capital spending really hasn't kept up with their ambitions, and it's clear it's unclear. If you look, just take a look in their uh, 10Ks or 10Qs and look at how they're spending their capital and how it's not increased uh, in in uh, relation to their ambitions, you wonder where the money is going to come from. And without a uh, major capital raise sometime soon, uh, they're going to have to uh, curtail some of these uh, plans, even if they're real. I mean, we'll see if the German one is ever built. They they they're not anywhere close to being able to sell enough cars right now in Europe uh, to justify a, a, a huge factory like that. So we'll see if uh, we'll see if that happens. What is what is Tesla's battery day look like to you? Is that something you're anticipating as a substantial upstep in in technology and in, in, in lowering of cost of batteries for Tesla or um, are, are you sort of waiting to w waiting until they make the announcement to to hold an opinion? Yeah, well, like everybody that covers Tesla, or frankly, everybody that's involved in automotive uh, batteries, engineers, uh, executives around the world are interested to see uh, what happens on Battery Day. Uh, will it be legit? Will it be mostly hype? Last time we had. Uh, Autonomy Day, and we're promised a million robo taxis by the end of this year, uh, which of course was ludicrous. Um, the uh, so how much my job will be trying to separate the uh, hype from the reality. Uh, they've got to deal with uh, CATL in China. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be some very interesting elements uh, connected with that deal, uh, but we'll see what's what's promised and what's delivered. Um, We'll see what kinds of new, actual new technologies are being talked about. We'll see if there's if if these can be made cheaper. We'll see if there if there's any uh, data or indication as to what uh, changes in manufacturing battery manufacturing technology are being made uh, that could possibly achieve those. Uh, if they're talking about uh, taking less uh, cobalt out of a out of a, a battery, a, a high power battery, uh, maybe some. Uh, some real detail, engineering detail on, on how that's possible. So um, maybe there's something truly revolutionary in the works. Uh, in, in the past, uh, they've overpromised and underdelivered. Uh, let's see what happens this time. Yeah, I, you know, I, I watched the, the autonomy day. The, the, the depth of detail that they went into was quite impressive. The fact that they're developing their, their, their own chip in conjunction with, I can't remember what, what, what company it, it is, but um, to, to, to me, that's, that's quite impressive. When it comes to the timeline of, of this, you know, the, the, million, the million vehicles, uh, the robo-taxis, okay, yeah. Um, I, I think anyone who follows the company should understand not to take timelines um, seriously when it comes out of, when it when it comes out of Elon's mouth, but um, I, I I would say that uh, it's not a matter of if, but when when that will happen. Now they have to continue to iterate the software. I, I I'm not in the camp that 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 autopilot and full self driving is anywhere near um, being ready, but. It's software, and I think you understand software that that it does get better and it has the ability to improve quickly over time. So, I, you know, the, the 2020 timeline, I, I get the criticism there, but um, you know, let, let's let's see what it looks like in, in in a year or two, and if it hasn't improved at all, then then I can understand why why people would 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 criticize it. But I, I suspect that 
it, it, it is and, and will get better um, to the point where eventually at some point, I don't know when, <laughs> it, it, the car will drive itself. Sure. And uh, yeah, the whether it's Tesla or, or other companies uh, and, and research uh, um, institutions that are working on this, uh, whoever it is, things are improving and rapidly improving, maybe not as fast as the industry had promised. Uh, but yeah, we're going to see driverless cars for sure. Uh, the question is how well they work. How quickly do you deploy technology like this on the highway and uh, pretend it can do more than it does and end up seeing you know people being killed as a result? Uh, those are important questions for uh, for regulators and for our uh, culture to answer. Uh, in terms of uh, developing your own chip, that's fine, but uh, I don't think you or I are in a position to uh, determine how important and how well that uh, chip actually uh, 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 is, is engineered. Uh, Tesla or any company can throw all kinds of uh, uh, very detailed engineering specs out that uh, the average, even the average informed person can't really understand and make it seem futuristic. But uh, as you point out, the, the proof is in the pudding and uh, we'll, we'll see how how, how it shakes out. Well, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Russ, thanks so much for taking the time to, to chat about the auto industry and Tesla and autonomy. Um, I want to give you a chance to um, let people know how they can follow you and uh, you know some of, some of those important things that you're, you're working on here in the near future. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter at, uh, at Russ1, numeral one, Mitchell. Um, I'm at the uh, LA Times, of course. I would uh, encourage uh, anybody who cares about the future of, uh, this is gonna sound high horse, but we're in an era where um, newspapers are dying. And uh, if and, and, and I think that, th that, that a, uh, a, a free media is essential to democracy. So uh, I would, uh, high horse or not, I would encourage uh, anyone to subscribe to the LA Times if you live anywhere in California or the regional newspaper of your choice, just getting the New York Times or just the Wall Street Journal, I think um, uh, does not serve the uh, the uh, community in which you live. So I would encourage people to subscribe to their local or, uh, or regional newspaper. Fair enough. Well, thanks again, Russ. Really appreciate the time and, and uh, interesting conversation. And uh, we'll I'll talk with you soon.